Hello and welcome to this webinar today. Karina is the Professional Advisor for Children and Young People for the College of Occupational Therapists and a Senior Lecturer in Occupational Therapy at Canterbury Christchurch University. Her background is working with children with specific learning difficulties and school-based occupational therapy practice. So I will just pass over to, to Karina in a second. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to let you all know that we will have time at the end of this webinar for questions. So the webinar and question session will last approximately an hour. If you do have questions as we go along, please type them into the question box on the webinar panel and we'll get to them at the end. So thank you again for listening today and over to you, Karina. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to those who have uh, joined us here for the webinar. Um, I hope that you'll find this uh, a useful and uh, interesting talk. Um, as was mentioned, uh, my interest, uh, I am a children's occupational therapist and uh, I have an interest in particular working with children in school settings. Um, and I've undertaken uh, my PhD research into school-based occupational therapy. So I'd like to share with you just um, uh, some of the practical strategies and some of the hints and tips that um, uh, hopefully you might find helpful in, uh, in your in your practice um, as, as teachers or classroom assistants um, and to just offer you perhaps what an occupational therapy perspective might be um, looking at some of the issues that the children are facing in your classrooms. So the presentation today, um, I'm going to just explain a little bit about what occupational therapy is and um, talk about the occupations of children uh, at school and um, occupational therapists, they, they see occupations as everything that we do in our everyday lives. So it's not just about uh, a job. Um, for occupational therapists, occupations are anything that occupies your time. So for children, we'll just go through what kind of uh, activities or tasks that they do to occupy their time when they're at school. Um, I'll then uh, provide a little bit of an insight into how occupational therapy actually works and some of the thinking behind what an occupational therapist might do in a school situation. And then really discuss some practical opportunities for change. Um, so looking at what are the things that we can uh, adapt or change or support the children to develop so that they can really get their full potential um, in the school situation. Um, then we'll talk about some of the capacities for change and what some of the different elements are that children are having to cope with on a day-to-day -day basis and perhaps why they might not be able to uh, undertake the, the classroom activities that we would like them to. And then think about how we can offer support to those children um, who require it at a specialist level, but also for those children who maybe don't meet the threshold or the requirements for some of the uh, services that we have available, and how we can support all of the children um, in the classroom. Finally, I'm going to be talking about just when to refer to an occupational therapist and uh, just some further information and resources. So occupational therapy uh, improves health and well-being through participation in occupation. So what that means is that um, an occupational therapist would see that participating in everyday activities, so going to school, um, getting themselves uh, getting their coats on and off uh, to go into the classroom, um, undertaking their classroom tasks, eating lunch, playing with friends, all of those things are actually going to have an impact on a child or young person's health and well-being. So occupational therapists don't necessarily go in and try and change the child necessarily um, and, and uh, develop something within them in order that they will be able to participate in the classroom. They try and enable that the child to participate in the classroom so that, um, and through that participation, that's how they're going to have uh, an improvement in their, their self-esteem, their self-confidence, their, their skills, their motor activities, and obviously their learning. So that might be a slightly different perspective um, to maybe some other professionals who might come in and try and focus on the, the issues which may be occurring within the child and try and remediate that or try and change that. Um, it's through occupation that occupational therapists would be able to uh, make changes to improve health and well-being. 
So the role of an occupational therapist uh, in a school situation, um, so an occupational therapist, we're concerned with how children and young people complete their tasks they need to do in their role as a student. Now in a school, uh, children have, take on many different roles. Um, so one is being as an academic scholar, uh, so to support their learning, but they also have a role as a player, as a friend, um, as a self-carer. Um, so there are many different roles that they undertake when they're at school. And what we are trying to do um, is to support the child in those roles. So the activities and the occupations that they do in order to fulfill those particular roles. So an occupational therapist might look at things like how the child is using their cutlery to eat their lunch, or how they're organising their belongings, or playing in the playground, or how they're using the, the tools and equipment, pencils, rulers and things to record their work. So this is um, very much works in collaboration with the teachers and the teaching assistants and the support staff within the school because they are the ones that are determining what the children need to be doing. So the lessons, the learning, um, where they're expected to be in relation to their peers. Um, and an occupational therapist would come in and support um, the teachers and the, the support staff in the school to help them be able to carry out those particular tasks that they're, they're maybe having trouble with, with doing. This slide really just goes through what um, some typical school occupations might be. So these are some of the things that we would be looking for um, as occupational therapists. So if a child has difficulty doing their schoolwork, so for example you might see them having trouble using a ruler or compass or maths blocks, so using their hands to be able to manipulate those kinds of tools and equipment. Um, they might have trouble um, using the computer or doing their handwriting or painting and drawing. There might be problems um, that you notice with children participating in sport, so um, the running, jumping, climbing and the PE games. And it's not just the physical things that we would be looking at, we would also be looking at how the child is planning and, and going about those particular activities um, and also maybe how they're interacting with their, with their peers during that, um, those activities. So in the classroom, there's also a lot of things that a child is meant to be doing um, that is beyond the academic aspect of their role. So listening and following directions and answering questions and knowing when to start and finish their work and trying to remember the instructions from the teacher in order to carry out their tasks. There's also a lot of school routines um, that the children have to uh, be involved with, so lining up and taking messages to different classrooms and navigating their way around the school. So all of these could cause children some challenges and this is what occupational therapists might be, might be concerned with. The, the self-care aspect of school, so looking after yourself, going using the toilet, blowing your nose, getting changed for sport, eating a meal and organising yourself, those are all also issues that often we see some children have, have some real struggles with undertaking in their classroom. Um, and there is also a significant uh, issue for some children with regards to how they socialise and how they interact with their peer group. And actually what we find is sometimes they're, they are limited in their doing of their occupations in the classroom, not because they uh, don't know how to do it or they don't have the skills to do it. It might be because they haven't um, developed the social skills in order to be able to interact successfully with their peer group. So some of the things which might be noticed in the classroom, um, and this might be for children who have a particular diagnosis, um, but it's also for children who maybe you've got some queries about and some concerns over who hasn't gone through a formal diagnostic process. So you might have concerns about some children attending to the tasks that they're having in the classroom. They might be disruptive, um, so talking when not appropriate or not facing the teacher. 
They could also be quick to give up on tasks and there is quite a concern about children who uh, don't really want to try things because they know that it's going to become challenging for them. So they prefer to um, maybe act out or be the class clown or just so that they can avoid some of the activities which maybe they are finding more challenging. We also have quite a, a number of children that we see um, who perhaps are just a bit slower to complete tasks, so handwriting or eating lunch. Um, or they might have specific issues with organising themselves or, or hanging up their coats. Um, some children, they often they don't maybe understand or keep up with the pace of what's going on in the classroom. So they repeatedly ask questions about what's happening next because maybe they can't hold in their heads what the routine for the day is and uh, if that routine changes they perhaps can become quite anxious and upset because they don't really have a map in their head about what the, the tasks and what the activities are going to be for the day. So that can lead to some uh, challenging behaviours and uh, some children might get quite emotional if there is changes to routine um, and that can manifest itself in many different ways um, which we might associate with um, the child just being, being difficult or um, acting out again. Um, but there might be a, a cause for that in that they are feeling uncertain or unsure about something. Some children still have uh, ongoing toileting issues and um, that could be because they um, maybe forget the routine of toileting, so what do you do first, what do you do next, or it might be because they've got some uh, issues maybe even uh, coordinating their buttons, so they, they might not be able to do up that top button or undo that top button um, so that when they get into the toilet they, they might be too late for um, for being able to use it successfully. Um, so some of these issues might lead to uh, children being withdrawn from play activities and this is perhaps more noticed when children ha are participating in unstructured play, so in the playground when they're given free time to do things, um, some children find that the most challenging situation to be in because they're not quite sure how to go about planning their time or how to approach other children to play. Um, they might be able to cope quite successfully in structured play opportunities, so maybe during sport where there's different, where there's distinct rules and there is somebody who is coordinating what they're meant to be doing. Um, but at times when the play is unstructured, that can be really quite challenging. And then we often see that children uh, display some really excellent avoidance strategies. Um, so they, they might, one of the classic avoidance strategies for doing sport is not bringing the clothing, the correct clothing to change into sport. Um, sometimes I, I have been working with um, some adults who had handwriting problems throughout school and for adults who were reflecting back on their time as, uh, in the classroom, they identified that their strategies was perhaps to become disruptive or hit the child that was next to them because then they would get taken to the, the head teacher's office and they got out of the task of handwriting because that's what they actually were finding really, really challenging. So it's, it's quite interesting to um, see how creative children can be with uh, coming up with some avoidance strategies for, for some of these challenging tasks. So an occupational therapist, what we would do is we would analyse how the child or young person is actually performing their tasks, so going about the tasks in the classroom. And through doing that, we're looking at the child's skills and abilities, but we're also looking at what are the requirements of the occupation and what's happening within the context. So what's happening within the classroom um, or playground or lunch hall um, where that task is being carried out because those uh, aspects will all have an influence on how the child is actually participating in their schoolwork tasks. So just to give you a little bit of an idea about how an occupational therapist might go about this, 
Um, I just want you to think for, for a minute or so about the steps involved in writing a story. So what kind of things do you think that uh, is required when you have a child who's been asked to write a story? What do you think they go through? So you may have been thinking about things like they might um, think about what they want to write, they might uh, use their imagination to uh, discover what kind of characters they're going to write about, they might think back to a situation that's happened for them, so when they went to the park or when they went to school, they might think about how to begin the story, what the middle of the story is going to be like, what the end of the story is going to be like. So there are certain ways um, and things, and it's quite challenging because I can't get the feedback from you at the moment, but I'm hoping that um, this kind of thinking, I mean, this is quite common um, and this is what we would expect and would be quite appropriate for, um, uh, for teachers or, or teaching staff. However, as an occupational therapist, um, I would come at this in a slightly different way. And here is just a few um, notes about the things that I would be looking at uh, in this particular situation. So there's a lot on this slide, but I would be looking at how the child is stabilizing their trunk to maintain their sitting position. I would look at their position of their body as a, uh, in relation to the table and the paper. I would look at to see if they initiate the task or if there's some hesitation. How do they search for, locate and choose appropriate pens and pencils? Can, can they reach forward? Can they support on that, prop on their arm and grip a pencil? Can they use an appropriate amount of force to, to grasp but not break it? Can they lift the pencil? Can they gather it back to their workspace? Can they um, use individual finger movements to be able to manipulate it in order to write? Can they coordinate both sides of their body? Can they um, use fluent arm movements to write their letters and words? Are they attending to the task or looking away to external things? Um, are they maintaining an appropriate pace, not too fast or too slow? Are they organising their workspace? Are they sequencing the writing task? Are they stopping when they need to, so not going on too long or stopping too soon? Are they keeping on task and do they put away their tasks and materials when they leave? So that's quite a, um, a, a detailed list of, of some of the things that um, I would be looking at as an occupational therapist. Um, and for me, the, the focus is on how they are undertaking that task of writing that story. Um, the actual academics of what they're writing, that's, um, that would, I would leave to the teacher and the teaching staff um, to, to be um, focusing on, but I would definitely be looking at how uh, the child is undergoing any of these um, actions within task. The reason that I would analyse this in such detail is because if um, there could be issues with the child's um, performance because any one of these aspects might break down for the child. And what I would suggest in terms of an, um, how to solve the problem that the child might be having, it's going to be different depending on what the issue is that the child is having. So, for example, if the child is having a trouble um, picking up their pen and manipulating it in their hand and having fluent arm movements to write, then I might be looking at what type of pen they're using. Is it that um, they have, uh, should they be using, do they have the, the skills, the, the motor skills to be able to do that? Is there other ways that we could support him, be supporting them to do that? So that would be quite different from if the problem was that the child isn't able to sequence the, start, the task. So if they weren't getting their pencil out before they needed to write or if they were um, trying to um, uh, use tools and materials in the wrong order. So if, if that was the issue, then I might look to give them a, a sequence so either written or, or pictures to show them what's expected each, um, for each step. So the issue that um, we identify that's causing the breakdown for the child, that's going to very much uh, influence the suggestions that are made for how we could um, try and support this child to do better uh, in, their, in their writing.
So when we're thinking about uh, opportunities for change and when, when an occupational therapist is looking at the factors which are influencing that child's uh, doing of the activities, the school occupations, we have this kind of image in mind. Um, so this is demonstrating that actually the child's ability to do the occupations is in the middle of this diagram. And they, the child has their own skills and abilities um, and they have their, like their, their age, their gender, their past experiences, their likes, their interests, their motivation. So all of those things would be considered in terms of that child circle. But that's not the whole picture um, about what's influencing a child doing their, uh, carrying out their tasks, carrying out their occupations. We also know that actually the, the context, um, so the environment that the activity is carried out in also has a really significant influence. Um, and perhaps you can think of this for yourself. Um, if you're needing to write um, a report or um, do something that requires a lot of concentration, you're probably going to change your environment to support you to concentrate on that task. So you might do this in a quiet space or you might be um, writing this uh, with no distractions around you um, and that will help your performance of writing. Um, you may not choose to go to a very busy um, assembly hall when assembly is going on to write your very careful report. So the context we know for ourselves does make a huge difference to how we are able to carry out our occupations. Um, and that, that happens with our skills and abilities remaining the same. So your skills and abilities, you as a person, would be the same as if you were writing your report in a quiet office or writing your report in the middle of the assembly, but your actual ability to do the task, I think, would be quite different. So we would also be looking at what the environment is like. What is the context like where the child is carrying out that occupation? And the third aspect that we can, uh, that we would be looking at is actually what are the requirements of the task, so the occupation. So we would break down the steps of the, the task and as I've just demonstrated on the previous slide, the steps in writing a story that we would be looking at um, are actually, there's quite a number of steps, it's a quite complicated process. So actually there might be ways that we could change the actual task to make it a bit simpler. Um, or we could also increase the challenge if a child might be coming um, bored uh, during, during the school day. So for example, if um, a child is having trouble um, putting on their shoes and socks um, and they're doing that within a busy PE changing area, we might be looking at um, does the child need uh, the context, does that need to change, can the child actually sit down to do their shoes and socks so that it's just creating a bit less of a challenge for them um, so they don't have to balance in order to, to put on their shoes and socks. We could also change the occupation, so we could say that actually the child's um, trainers that they came to school in are okay for, um, uh, for playing sport, so actually they might not need to, to do that shoe change um, during, the, during the day. So we could change things in relation to the occupation, to the activity, we could change things in relation to the school context, and we can also help the child to develop their own skills and abilities. Um, so I'm just going to go and explore each one of those in a little bit more detail and just give some practical ideas about how, um, what kinds of things you might want to look at uh, in terms of what we can change. So if we start first with the occupation. Um, we could ask ourselves what aspects of the task are making it difficult. So for example, is it the instructions, can they be simplified, is there something that, um, and I've been in classrooms when sometimes what happens is that the teacher is, is providing quite a lot of instructions as well as a lot of teaching concepts um, and it's a lot for the children to hold in their heads and then they go off and try and do the activity and um, perhaps they've forgotten part of what the instructions were meant to be. 
So is there a way that we can make that simpler? Um, is there a way of providing some more structure or providing a template? And I think this is part of changing the task. Um, is it possible to have a worksheet so that maybe the learning objective for the, the classroom activity is already pre-printed on the sheet for the students? So making that a little bit simpler for the for the children or providing a template of exactly how you're expecting the work to be completed. We could also um, change the time um, or the volume of the, of the actual activity. So for some children they might not be able to um, take on as much as what other children are um, or conversely other children um, might need to have extra. Um, opportunities uh, for, for the undertaking work because they, they might need that challenge and that stimulation. We could also um, have the opportunity to change some of the materials. So if um, there's a picture on that slide um, changing the materials or the, or the tools, um, the picture on the slide is looking at um, some easy grip scissors. So they are just adapted scissors, which means that it's, it's um, not quite as challenging for the scissors to open up again um, when you're doing that snipping action. So can something like that be helpful for um, the child to be able to develop some of their scissor skills? Can, uh, staying with scissors, can we make the paper a bit stiffer, a bit thicker, so that that is um, a little bit easier for the child to carry out their tasks? So changing the size, weight, speed or timing of an activity and I think this is where um, colleagues who, who teach sport are really excellent at trying to grade or try and change the way that a sporting activity for example happens. So if you have a bigger ball then that's going to make the challenge easier. If you, so you have a basketball that's going to be easier than throwing and catching a tennis ball. Um, is there something that can be changed about the speed or the timing? Can we allow a little bit more time um, or can we slow things down um, for the child? And is there a, a possibility of using technology? Um, we have so much available to us and uh, often children are actually very experienced with handling different um, gadgets that it might make it easier for, for children to use a computer or can there be an opportunity for them to uh, audio record some of their stories so that perhaps they can get their ideas out without having to go through um, writing them down, handwriting them down if, if writing is a challenge for them. So the other images on that slide are just um, really things that I'm sure that you've already uh, have in your classroom, and these are quite good active, uh, quite good strategies that you could use with everybody. Um, so it won't do anybody harm to have like a little bit more um, explicit the steps in the activity, or giving the option to demonstrate. Um, some children don't have a concept of time, so they might if you say you've got 10 minutes to finish something, it's almost like you're saying you've got blah minutes to, to finish something um, because they don't actually have an, an internal sense of how long a minute is or how long 10 minutes is. So for some children, they might need a visual to tell them how much time is left. Um, and that might be an analog clock, it might be a digital clock, you might use sand timers or egg timers so that the children can actually see time passing and they know when, when an activity should come to an end. So there are so many different options um, for, for changing the particular occupation and they are very much um, specific to whatever it is that you're trying to get, um, uh, that the child is having trouble with and, and what you're wanting them to be able to do. So the next area that offers us opportunities for change is within the school context and often we have um, we have quite a lot of control over things that are happening within the occupation and things that are happening within the school context, perhaps even more so than what's happening within the child. So this might be another way that we actually could make some changes um, uh, to support maybe all children's participation. So one of the things within the context is the people within the context. 
And some children, they may respond better to some adults or other children within the, the context than others. Um, and what teachers and school staff might like to consider if is what the ultimate goal of the activity is and is there a different way to allow for the success. So th the example that I've got on the slide there is if children are finding it challenging to concentrate when they're sitting on the carpet, perhaps if we got them to sit on the chair or lean up against a wall, then they would be able to concentrate on whatever the activity is on the carpet. So changing the expectation, not lowering it, but changing the expectation that actually we want them to concentrate on what's happening on the classroom um, it, on, for carpet time rather than concentrate on them sitting down on the carpet and maintaining their balance and maintaining their position while they're sitting. Um, it just frees them up a little bit to be able to concentrate on what you want them to concentrate on. Likewise, um, this is often uh, my experience with writing stories and trying to record work. Um, and it's, it's a, quite a good question to ask. What is it that I, we're hoping to achieve with this particular task? Are we trying to achieve like an imaginative, creative story that um, has different plots and like character formations? And, and if that's the ultimate aim of the particular activity, then perhaps doing it in a handwritten format might not be the best way for that child to express what they what they know and what they could do. Um, I have had many children who are really creative, but actually when it comes to writing, they end up writing very simple sentences um, and two or three lines when I know that they're very capable of much, much more. Um, and, and so it's just looking at what are the different um, outcomes that you're wanting and maybe if the outcome is for them to develop handwriting then you focus on developing handwriting absolutely but if the outcome is if you're wanting something different then maybe there is a different way that we could look um, for that child to be able to achieve that. Um, Supporting attention and concentration, this is um, a real challenge for a lot of children in, in schools and this is quite often where um, it's real, um, uh, it does become quite disruptive within classrooms when, when children aren't attending and concentrating um, and then they experience some um, challenging behaviours perhaps. Um, and I guess some of the bullet points really just to think about if a child is having problems attending and concentrating, I always wonder what their understanding is like. Do they actually understand what is going on, what has been asked of them, what the expectations are? Do they understand the language that's being used? Do they understand and can they remember what, what needs to happen? Um, where is it breaking down for, for the child? And it might be that they can do certain parts of the task, but then when it comes to uh, other parts, that's when they're having real trouble and that's when the breakdown happens. So it might be when they're um, talking with the teacher about their story that they um, are really engaged, but then as soon as they go to try and write something down, um, that's when the task breaks down and they lose concentration. Sometimes uh, children need to be shown how to do things and maybe shown more than once how to do things. Um, quite a lot of learners' uh, experiences are, um, we do a lot of teaching and it's exactly what I'm doing today, it's through talking, so through auditory and through talking to people. And quite often um, people learn best through doing or through modelling. Um, so getting somebody to show you what to do and then you having a go yourself. So sometimes the, um, in order to support a child being able to do a task, it might need them, um, you might need to demonstrate it a few times and get them to do it along with you or um, to do it straight after you and then to practice. Um, so that could be a way of supporting their attention and concentration. Um, children often also need time to process information and I've worked with a number of children who actually have um, their, their speed of processing the um, information that they've received from uh, a, a teacher's direction is actually quite slow. 
So you might give them a instruction and then actually it takes them four or five seconds to process that instruction. So if I give you an example of um, here is some information that I'm wanting you to process So it might take that long for a child to actually determine what it is that you're asking. Um, and five seconds, it seems like a very long time. And what sometimes we try and do is jump in and, and say the instruction again. And if we say the instruction again, often we use different words. So we might say, um, first of all, please hang up your coat. And then, Johnny, can you hang up your coat, please? And what's actually happening is that we're giving them an extra layer of information to then process, which then takes them even more time. So sometimes just sitting back and, and being a little bit comfortable with the silence can help some children just to be able to process the information um, that they're trying to take in. The other opportunity that we have for changing changes to the school context is within the physical or um, within the physical environment. So we could consider changing aspects like um, the noise level, the number of people, the lighting, or the position of the child in the classroom. So just having a look at how the classroom is arranged, um, I had one child who was getting very, very distracted. And what I noticed in the classroom was that he was sitting um, towards the side of the classroom, right where the children had all of their um, tools and materials located, so in drawers and in, in trays. And actually what was happening is um, the, every time a child went up to get a new pencil or a, a book or something like that, then they would walk past this particular child with attention and concentration issues um, and, and maybe even bump into the chair or, or just be, be quite distracting because there wasn't quite enough space for the children to move around the classroom. Um, and that, um, a simple change was just um, changing his position in the classroom, that did have um, quite a, a substantial impact on how he was then able to, to attend to his school tasks. So there's, there's things within um, the environment that we might be able to, to change. Another example that I had was um, around um, the, the decorations in, this, in the classroom. Um, I'm always fascinated by um, how creative some of the classroom displays are and they, they look amazing, they look beautiful, they've got, um, they've got lots of meaning held in them. But actually sometimes um, for some children that can be quite overwhelming and maybe quite visually distracting. So if there is a lot of clutter that's around the board, then they might have difficulty picking out the bit that they need for that activity. So they might have trouble picking out what the word is written on the board if there is lots of other displays around the board. So there is, there is definitely a place for a lot of creativity and um, lots of displays and things, but perhaps also consider what are the children looking at when they're trying to concentrate and is there a way that we can perhaps put um, the, some of the displays in, in one area of the room rather than have it um, around the entire classroom. So it's looking at, um, and sometimes this is easier if you step back or maybe even go into somebody else's classroom. Um, I think one of the benefits that I have when I'm working in, um, in schools is that I can go in with a fresh pair of eyes and maybe things that you've had in place for a long time, you kind of stop seeing after a while. So um, it might be useful if um, you went into other people's classrooms and, and have, gave some suggestions and likewise have people come into your classroom and make some suggestions. Finally, the um, opportunities for change um, within the child or the young person. Um, and there are lots and lots of different techniques and strategies and, um, for, for this to happen. And I think the teachers are, and school staff are really expert at trying to, um, at, at supporting learning, um, which is essentially about changing the child or young person. So um, there are so many different strategies that, that you already have, which, um, which I, I 
would very much encourage uh, being used in perhaps a slightly different way. Um, like I mentioned before, some children might need to be um, taught rather than learn through experience. For, for the majority of children, if you um, give them the exposure to an activity, they will pick it up for themselves and they will be able to, to understand and, and, and work uh, and to, to learn that. But for some children, they don't have that um, particular skill or ability or maybe it's not as well developed. So they might need to be explicitly taught how to do a particular activity. Um, teaching things step by step, I think teachers are incredibly um, skilled at being able to do that. Um, and I guess that applies not only to the, to the academic work but also to, to other things like um, using the toilet or using cutlery um, and activities like that. So teaching it one step at a time. Um, the other thing is to draw attention to key aspects of the task. So if, it, if a task is breaking down for a child, um, because they're not holding the paper still when they're writing, rather than trying to um, work on too many things at any one time, getting the child to actually stabilise the paper um, might be a good starting point. So you might say to, to the child, um, uh, is there anything that you could see to help you keep the paper still? And then helping the child to maybe think of their own strategies for um, developing that particular activity. I think sometimes what um, we're very good at is offering our own strategies for, to children. And uh, when we do that, so for example, we might say, put your hand on the paper so that you keep it stable. Now that becomes our own strategy rather than the child's strategy. So you might find that the child doesn't really engage with that strategy and they might forget it the next time that they um, come to do that task. So rather than saying, why don't you hold the paper, turn it into a question. So what could you do to make the paper more stable? And they could come up with a range of different strategies. And if it's safe, then it, I think it's worth trying out some of their strategies. So if they say that they want to put sticky tape on the, on the table um, in order to stabilise their paper, try it out. And then if they decide that actually that doesn't work because they need to move the paper around, um, then they've come to that conclusion by themselves um, and they're more likely to learn about that strategy and to, to um, uh, remember it for the next time round. The other thing that um, is, uh, seems incredibly obvious, but um, if you want a child to get better at doing something, um, practice doing that something is, is going to be the most beneficial. Um, so if they want to get better at kicking a football, then actually we should be kicking football. Um, if they want to get better at um, handwriting, then actually they need to practice handwriting. So there are, um, I guess that's where we, we try and keep things as close to the activity as possible, um, but then allowing quite a lot of opportunities to practice and practice in different ways so that they might be able to transfer some of their, their skills to one, from one situation to another. So for example, if they want to get better at kicking a football, then maybe they can kick a football during PE, but then also maybe you can have footballs available for them to kick around during playtime, and then maybe have um, a suggestion that they try and kick a football at home as well. So trying to find lots of opportunities to practice um, in many different environments so that um, they can transfer some of the skills that they've learned. So the other point that I just wanted to, to um, raise with, within the seminar today is thinking about the capacity. So we've just talked about quite a lot of areas where, where we could change things um, for, for a child in order to enhance what they're doing in the classroom. Um, and sometimes what um, it might be quite helpful to think about is the child's capacity or even our own capacity. It's kind of like a bucket. 
Um, and if we fill our bucket with things like listening to the teacher and balancing on the chair, trying to block out the posters on the wall, then looking at the teacher, and then we, we might already be quite full with all of those different things that we're taking on at that one time. And then we try and add in doing the academic component within the um, classroom and maybe that's just the bit that's too much. So that's the bit that kind of tips it over, tips us over the edge with, um, with how much we can cope with. So it might be think, useful to think about what is the child actually um, dealing with at the moment? What are the things that are taking their attention and concentration? What are the things that they're having to think about? And is there any of those elements that we could perhaps reduce? So for example, if they're trying to block out the posters on the wall, so those visual distractions that we talked about earlier, could we take that out by maybe reducing some of the visual distractions in, uh, at the front of the classroom. So maybe that would then leave a bit of extra, extra capacity for the child to be able to concentrate on doing their, their, their work. So that's the similar um, to maybe even in social situations. If a child is really having problems playing with their peers, um, some of the things that are already in their bucket are things like not knowing what the rules are or having other children being um, not understanding why they're behaving in a certain way. Maybe there's also things about um, the opportunities available are very much geared towards climbing and kicking balls and maybe they're not good at that. So maybe there's a lot of things in the bucket already which means that that social interaction capacity is, is, um, is a bit limited. But if we maybe gave them some more structure, so gave them a small group that they would um, uh, do some uh, interacting with, uh, have a teacher support or teaching assistant support um, so that we can structure what it is that they're going to do within that activity, maybe that will give them a bit of extra space and a bit of extra capacity to be able to concentrate on actually interacting with, with their peers. So, and I think this is something that we can apply to ourselves as well. If there are a lot of things that are kind of filling up our buckets, then maybe things that we could cope with at one point, we can't cope with today because it's just too much for, for that particular day. So, just um, thinking about how we might support children in the classroom. Um, and perhaps this is more, um, occupational therapists I think have tended to work at the top of this triangle. So they have tended to work with the children who are complex, who have very high support needs and, um, and we, we focus our attention there. Actually, with a lot of the public health messages that are coming through in government legislation and also looking at the effectiveness of our um, services and how we could deliver them, we might um, be more effective if we focus some of our provision um, at the bottom of this pyramid, so the support for whole school design. So maybe there is something that we can put in place which actually will support all of the children in the school um, uh, such as if we um, uh, investigate what the handwriting policy is within the school and maybe we could make some uh, suggestions for enhancing that. So that would help all of the children with their handwriting in the school. Then for some children that's not going to, that's going to be fine. Um, for the majority of children that's probably going to be fine. But for some children that's not going to be quite enough. So then we would see about working at the next level. So in small groups of children in class. So can we do a homework club to help with the handwriting for a small group of children? Or can we do um, maybe a lunchtime club to support some children using cutlery or opening up lunch packets and things like that? For the majority of children that will be fine, but then there are going to be some children that that's not going to be sufficient for that kind of group work. So then you would go up to the next level and perhaps for some children they would need some individual different support need, um, to, to meet their particular needs. 
And for some children that might not be enough, so yes, we are going to have to go up to that complex out of class support, so there are different things that we might need to do with some children. But as you move up the pyramid, you're going to get less and less children. And this kind of idea has been talked about in education, um, and there has been some literature around, um, it's called response to intervention, which you may be familiar with. Um, and it's a similar idea. Let's provide um, uh, some, in, some involvement, some input to the whole group, and then if that doesn't work for some children, then we, we escalate the support that's required. So that's certainly um, what we would be encouraging um, from the College of Occupational Therapists. That's what we're encouraging our occupational therapy colleagues to actually um, be looking at within their service. And I know of some examples where schools have actually um, decided to get together with a number of schools in order to get some occupational therapy involvement, not just for a one-to-one -one individual um, support, but to focus on the whole class or the whole school um, and look at the support needs of a range of, of children rather than just an individual one-to-one -one support. So just to finish up, um, when to refer to an occupational therapist. Um, this is indicated when there's established school supports that are in place and the child or young person continues to experience issues carrying out their school occupations. So there are a lot of things that schools are doing already that support children and young people to be able to carry out their tasks that they need to do in school. Um, but if those have been exhausted and, um, and there are still issues that are, are happening, um, then certainly an occupational therapist might be able to give you a different perspective or come in and, and perhaps do more detailed analysis so that we can work out where it's breaking down for the child and then work together to put in place a, pro a plan to be able to support the ch children's own school occupations. So just to finish off, there are um, there's a couple of resources that you might find um, useful. Um, there's the College of Occupational Therapists website, and we have a number of different um, resources which are available on that website. Um, Box of Ideas is another uh, um, service which uh, has videos and illustrations and literature specifically related to um, learning difficulties like dyslexia, dyspraxia, attention deficit disorder, um, Asperger's, and there's quite a lot of practical suggestions for teachers and parents. Um, likewise, the Can Child website um, has a lot of information. Um, there is particularly around children with cerebral palsy as well as coordination difficulties, um, and there are some uh, resources that are available on that website um, for practical implementation in the classroom. So finally, I just want to say thank you very much for your attention, and um, I hope that you found some of these uh, um, slides useful and our conversations useful. Um, my the website is is the College of Occupational Therapists. We do have a couple of uh, brochures which talk about what occupational therapy is in schools, as well as what occupational therapists do with children and young people. So we'd be quite happy to send you out um, some some brochures or um, just direct you to some of our resources on the website. So I'd just like to say thank you very much and uh, welcome any questions. Hi, Karina. Thank you very much for that webinar. You're welcome. I just um, will say to everyone, if you do have any questions, please type them into the question box and I'll just leave it open for a little while just to see if we have any coming through. So um, we've got someone saying, excellent webinar, thank you. So that's nice to have that feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs> much appreciated. And as um, we've said, this has been recorded, so we'll be sending you out the recordings within the next week or so, as, along with um, a copy of the slides as well. And that would also be available on our college website. So we're gonna we're gonna post this one as well. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any questions coming through. Um, so hopefully you've got all the information you wanted out of the presentation. It was nice and detailed. So that was very good. Thank you, Karina. Um, I'll end the webinar there. Thank you everyone very much for listening, and hopefully we'll see you on another one of our webinars this week. Thank you. Thank you.